Santor, ha! Santor, ha! Santor, ha! Santor, Santor, Santor. Uh, new episode of Doctor Who came out. It was better. I think we're in the wilderness years again. I think, I think we've been in the wilderness years since like 2016, maybe. I've come, to, I came to this conclusion a few weeks ago, actually, before series 13 started airing, but I sort of been turning over my head a little bit. And while we have received Doctor Who content, a lot of it actually, since 2016, I think that we're in another wilderness years. I think nobody gives two shits about Doctor Who anymore. Except for me, and I guess a couple of other people that you might have heard of. Nobody really talks about it anymore. And we're just kind of like our own little circle of the internet. Going around and round and round like time. Bickering over some wacky alien character and why the tenth version of him is the worst one. Back on track, more of the Santarans. It was an okay episode. Not the best episode. I think actually, as far as Santaran episodes go, it's better than the two doctors for sure. It's better than Stantarum Stratagem. It's better than the Invasion of Time. Actually, I think it's just a little better than Invasion of Time. It's sort of the same tier of Invasion of Time. Invasion of Time's like the bottom of D tier, and maybe like War of the Santarans is bottom of C tier. They're they're close and they're in proximity of each other. I should update the the tier list after series 13 is over. Would you guys like to see that? Comment below if you want to see me update my tier list. Anyway, episode begins in the monster house place. Doctor wakes up in a place that's black and white. She sees a monster house. Um, only bringing this up because a lot of people are drawing comparisons between this episode and the two doctors, oddly enough, because they both start with a black and white scene. I think this episode is very similar to the War Games, which makes this episode even worse in comparison to the War Games, because of how every single part of the War Games is actually a masterpiece. But you got an alien race who likes fighting. They do their fisticuffs, they rough them up, and they're testing their fighting on the humans and their history. Just a little comparison I noticed there. It's kind of like how Orphan 55 reminded me of the mysterious planet. You know, Orphan 55 last season, everyone's favorite episode, that where there was revealed that they were on Earth the whole time. That happened in the 80s already. And then uh, almost equally bad story, to be fair. We get another point of convenience as the TARDIS crew gets flung to the exact time period that the Santorans happen to be testing their strategy. Um, so that's just more plot contrivance with Flux. Flux is gonna be full of fucking plot contrivance by the time we're done. There's gonna be at least like three big coincidences every single episode of Flux. I'm calling it now. I'm calling it now. Every single episode of Flux is gonna have at least three big plot contrivances. And if I'm wrong, then you owe me $50. If I'm right, you owe me 100 I wanna ch touch real quick on two things. First of all, it's a historical kind of, which means in the Tr Chris Chibnall era, of course, it's better than all the rest of the episodes. War of the Santarans, no doubt in my mind, this is gonna be looked back on as the best episode of the season because it's a historical. Actually, I think the Weeping Angels episode is also gonna be historical. But I actually don't like the Weeping Angels, so I'm just gonna say that this one's better before he's seeing that. Like a good circle jerk. Santarans in this, like I touched on last time, the Santarans in this episode, best they've ever looked ever. 
the best Santarin design I've ever had. It's like the classic design, new. Uh, like, like if the episode The Time Warrior, which is the first episode the Santarans appeared in, if that episode was made today, I would expect Lynx to look like the Santarans look in this episode. That is how you do a monster redesign correctly. You don't slap them in blue Power Ranger armor, and you don't make them weird steampunk fly things. Although, to be honest, the Russell T. Davies Daleks, they do look pretty good. So we meet Mary Seacole, who is a person that doesn't get a lot of attention in history. I didn't know who she was before this episode. This episode taught me something. All of the Chris Chibnall historicals are really good with how they deal with guest uh, celebrity uh, historical people. Except for the haunting of Villa Diodati. That was, ooh, that, that one, I don't really like how they implied that as if you have writing skills, you're better than everyone else. Even though I do have writing skills, even though writing is literally the one thing I'm good at, I don't like it being implied that I'm better than other people just because of that. Because I'm not. Uh, um, we get to see Vendor again. That's cool. I thought he might have been dropped honestly, but I'm glad he wasn't. I'm glad he remains a character present in the plot. And later on, we get Yaz and him trying to figure out what's happening in this Temple of Atropus area. And I really like the dynamic they have. It's really cool, in my opinion. Dan and Yaz are going away by time shortly after meeting Mary Sakal. And the doctor learns that Sontarans have infested Earth history and they've replaced Russia and China. Dan gets teleported to Liverpool, which just so conveniently happens to be the place the Santarans are building their ships. And it's Liverpool at the exact like time period he left as well. So that's another contrivance. That's what, two contrivances really this episode? Th three if you count Yaz meeting up with Vendor in the Temple of Atropos, which I kind of do because, I mean, it kind of makes sense that just Yaz would meet this random person that she's never met before in this weird temporal displacement thing, but it doesn't make sense that she just happens to be conveniently teleported to the one location Swarm needs in the entire universe. I wanna say real quick, because a lot of my review of the last episode and a lot of my review of this episode is pointing out conveniences in the plot that maybe a lot of other people didn't notice. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, I don't know. But I wanna explain real quick that I don't think convenience in a story is a bad thing in and of itself. Sometimes stories need a little convenience to just get going. You know, that's how the main characters meet, that's how the plot gets going. You know, we're watching the story because the main characters just happen to be the ones that are involved with it, and that's why we're watching them. But a story can easily become really bad if it relies on convenience, and so far, Flux relies upon stacks and stacks of convenience. It's like... The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens? Who that movie, you may think it's a little, it's obviously the best of the sequels, but you may think it's good on the first watch and the second and third one maybe. On the fourth one, you begin to realize, if you hadn't already, that there's a lot of convenience in that plot with just the way things stack up. And that's exactly what's happening here. I feel like a lot of people aren't going to realize the first couple of watches of Flux, but after they go back through and really start analyzing it, they're going to be like, that's a lot of things just kind of went right there for our heroes. That, that's a little wacky. And maybe it will be explained later. Maybe, maybe the fucking white guardian is going to come out of nowhere and he's going to say, hey, doctor. Uh, they had to retire my character ever since the 80s because they figured that bringing me and my counterpart, the Black Guardian, back might inadvertently, uh, like, support racist ideologies. But now I'm back, and I just want to tell you that I've been doing this for you. I've been causing all these conveniences for you so that you could win against Swarm and his sister. Maybe that'll happen, and if it does happen, and all the conveniences explained like that, it'll still feel like a cop-out, but it'll feel like less of a cop-out as it would if it just went unexplained, I, I guess. Um, Yaz meets the man from 1820. He's only in this one scene, just like he was only in that one scene last episode. 
I still don't know what's going on with him. Oh well. Uh, but he's on the space station with Vendor and Yaz in one scene before he fucks off. Cause he's got to go fix things. Yaz and Vendor have to fix things for themselves, however, as they realize these Mori people, which apparently this Temple of Atropus is controlled by the Mori, and the Bill Murray people control time, and the planet's called time, but they also control, like, the flow of time. Which I thought the Time Lords were supposed to do. <laughs> okay, I, I guess not. I guess not. The Centaurans have, like, Stormtrooper aim when they're gunning for Dan, like, Call of Duty's, like, pew, pew, pew. And Dan just sort of, like, does this. He doesn't dodge at all, he just sort of does this, an entire squad of Santar and miss him. And also he just conveniently meets up with his fucking mom and dad who knock him in the back of the head and take out the Santarans for a little bit. Um, which is equally stupid and another convenience. And I feel like having his mom and dad there added nothing to the plot anyway. These could have just been random people. They didn't have to be Dan's mom and dad. Like, this is just insanely contrived oh well we meet his generic new who family this generic you new who family is similar to donna's which before yaz's generic you who new who family was the best generic you new who family but uh, it's still stupid uh, yaz has this message written on her hands which has never been seen before and therefore is equally unimpressive when we get its payoff we learn later that it stands for what would the doctor do which is just something she could have fucking whispered to herself in this moment. She didn't need to set up a plot point that was only going to be relevant for this episode. A generic British general bad guy who doesn't listen to the Doctor. He's generic, yeah, but his character didn't really need to reinvent the wheel, I felt. He's serviceable in his role, even though he's kind of predictable. We learned this scene that the Santarans spreading through history. This is where we learned that they replaced Russia and China. We also learned later on that they wanted to do this. <laughs> because they were following up on Lynx's claim to the planet, which was originally staked in the Time Warrior, which is so in character for the Santarans. This, their motivation in this episode makes so much sense. I actually do love it. Chibnall really did the Santarans correctly. Uh, Seiko reveals to the Doctor that she is currently caring for a wounded Santaran soldier, which is uh, something she actually did for Russian soldiers as well, historically, and the Doctor points that out. So that's cool. The scene later, the uh, scene sets up that uh, Santarans need a short rest period every 27 hours, which you find out is not only a biological process, but it's also something that they need to refuel their suits so they can live in Earth's atmosphere outside their ships. And this refueling process is done on the ships themselves. So how is this Santaran still alive if he needs to refuel his suit? Because he's got no way of refueling his suit. This does never gets explained. It's never explained how he lives at all. I, it's, I, I. This wounded guy, Santaran guy, is played for laughs, but I think it's excusable because he does get executed uh, later on by the Santaran general, which really, you know, shows that they aren't to a force to be reckoned with. Anyway, the doctor tricks the Santaran into thinking that she has information about the doctor's location. You know, she refers to herself in the third person to sort of trick him. And the Santaran, uh, she gets him to report back to his base after letting him go. And he leads the Doctor and Mary on the Sar to the Sartaran base. Sartaran? Santaran. Doctor is well aware that she's sending him to his death, I'd like to point out. But I actually don't mind this as much as other people might. I'm always fine with the Doctor kind of tricking people into their own deaths or otherwise killing people. I'm so fine with that. Actually, <laughs> like, I... I, Seven is one of my favorite doctors. He did that shit all the time. Uh, three, my favorite doctor of all time, has a clip where he infamously guns down Ogrons in Day of the Daleks. That's, I, I support that. I, I think the doctor totally would kill things. He's, they aren't really a pacifist. That's sort of just a new who thing. They hate violence, but they, they aren't, willing to take unnecessary sacrifices just to avert violence. That's never been a part of the Doctor's character until New Who. Actually, it really started being a part of his character with the Fifth Doctor, but 
That's its whole other can of worms. Oh, yeah, also, I just have written down here, fuck the sonic screwdriver. I'm sure that 13 did some stupid shit with her magic wand again. Jesus Christ, please kill the sonic screwdriver. I don't want to see it. It's, it's bad. Arius left to monitor the Santaran base as Doctor uh, gets ready to parlay with the Santarans. Um, and we learned that the Santarans showed up two days ago, having slipped past the Lupari ships. Also, the Lupari ships making a shell around the Earth is an event referred to as the Three-Minute Eclipse, uh, as the whole world went into darkness, right? Implying that the fleet surrounding Earth, which is currently still surrounding Earth, only lasted three minutes. But that's obviously not true. Like, theoretically, the Lupari ships should still be around Earth in order to stop the flux. And the fact that the world is still in utter darkness, although the scene could just be shot at night, seems to support this. But we learn later from Carvanista that the Lupari are still above the Earth. So obviously this eclipse is still happening. So why is it called the three minute eclipse? Did it take three minutes to happen? What? The, I don't know. I don't. Dan leaves his parents. He goes in armed with a walk. Also, this is the last time we ever see his parents for the rest of the episode. So I hope you liked them. We do see Santarans execute a group of humans later on. Um, which I think is another great step in sort of building up the threat throughout this episode. I actually really like that that happened. We go back to the Temple of Atropus place where Vendor and Yaz meet up, and these priest triangle things tell them they gotta repair, uh, the Mori. Yeah, they gotta repair the Mori because they're dying off. I don't know why the Mori, if they're great beings, I don't know why they didn't make a failsafe for the priest triangles to, to deal with this. But oh well. The doctor calls for a parlay with the Santaran leader, and they have a really great conversation actually. Although the doctor does make some digs at the Santaran that seem out of character. Well, they aren't out of character for 13, but since 13 herself is out of character for the doctor, they're out of character. Having a Santaran serve as an intellectual part of the episode is rather unique, and it harkens back to older Santaran stories like the Time Warrior and the Santaran Experiment, where yes, the Doctor did engage the Santarans in fights, but they also did talk to each other, like equals, um, and sort of have these sort of conversation moments. The General's explanation for why exactly the Santarans are in the Crimean War era, however, is a little less sound. Uh, they chose it because it was full of conflict, which describes literally every single war in Earth's history. <laughs> I, like, a better explanation for this could have just been they needed a smaller scale testing field and the Crimean War was something perfect for that. They didn't, they didn't need to just say, conflict, that's why we chose specifically the Crimean War. That is a little stupid, I think. Uh, the doctor's conversation with him is cut short when the human general man comes in. He has a soldier escort her off the field as he begins battling the Santaran army. Not a single fucking Santaran dies here, which is based... It's badass, it lets you know the Santarans aren't fucking around, they are ready to kill literally leagues of humans. Without a second thought, without so much as a little, oh, maybe that's not good. No, they are hardcore, they are Call of Duty gamers. Battlefield gamers. They don't mess around. Uh, the Doctor uses Venusia Nikito to escape from her guard, and that's always nice to see. I think that's the second time she used it now. Uh, she... Uh, the Twelfth Doctor and the Third Doctor are particularly fond of using Venusia Nikito. Um, which, and I always think it's nice when Venusia Nikito pops back up again. Swarm and Azur show up on the Temple of Atropos with a new guy named Passenger who just literally comes out of nowhere. Why the fuck are the three of them now? I think two is actually more than enough. I actually think two is too much. This plot would have been perfectly fine with just Swarm. Why do we need Azur and now Passenger here? Maybe it will be explained later on, but I guarantee you whatever explanation Chibnall comes up with for having three villains instead of just Swarm is something that he could have easily written into Swarm's character anyway. He could have just had it to where Swarm was the sole bad guy and it wouldn't have changed much because he's the head fucking writer of this thing. So yeah, even if... Azure and Passenger are explained later on and they're given a full purpose later on, that doesn't excuse the fact that them being there takes away from having a central antagonist to Flux. And because they're there, we get less character development of Swarm as himself. We're already uninvested in Swarm. We already don't care about Swarm. Because Swarm's a guy we've never met, 
but we've been told that Swarm is a guy who has fought the Doctor before. He's been there from the beginning. At this point, Swarm could have just been Sutek or Omega or the Black Guardian or the Master. Like, the Great Intelligence. Hey, if Swarm was the Great Intelligence skin, that'd be cool. Bring back Richard DeGrant. Bring back him. But no. No. Uh, we are... Um, we're, we're just stuck with this generic evil bad guy who's like, ooh, haha, -ha, I am in control, and I'm a little charismatic, and and I, I always have the upper foot. <laughs> like a mustache twirling villain. He literally looks like he's wearing like a tuxedo, his character design. He, he, he literally looks like a James Bond villain. Get back to the battlefield, Sontarans win, and they begin killing uh, anyone who's got faking death, which is actually a thing that the Germans did a lot in World War II. I also think it's something that happens frequently in war, but it's it, it's most popular in World War II movies, I think, where the Germans are shown being ruthless bastards for, like, developing the threat. And that's always neat, you know. Uh, it's not neat that actual people died. That's not neat. But it's a good way to build the threat of characters in a fictional work. Doctor and Mary go to the Sontaran ship when the enemy is out, which is, again, rather unguarded. You know, Dan is sneaking into a Sontaran ship at this point, by the way which is unguarded, and the Doctor and Mary are doing the same thing, and it's relatively unguarded. Like, surely the Sontarans did not send their entire army to fight against the puny Brits. The one guy that is there gets easily dispatched by the Doctor, and then they contact Dan, who was on another ship, pressing random buttons in the future, but I, that doesn't really matter, because the Sontaran ships have obviously been shown to be time vessels. This is something that's established in the canon. Thank God Dan didn't, like, fuck something up. He even says when he goes to press random buttons, he's like, hope I don't press the self-destruct. Boop, 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 He just so happens to contact the one ship that the Doctor is on, and they start talking. The Doctor uses her magic wand to access all of Dan's uh, phone data, despite the fact that he is on the other side of the screen and across time. Anyway, she downloads Dan's little vlog from his phone. And um, this is how she learns about the Santaran plan. The two are cut off by Santarans, however, and Dan uses the good old um, over your shoulder trick by the Santaran that goes for him, and it works. So all of that threat that the Santarans built up throughout the episode is gone. It's no longer here. Um, then a group of Santarans comes in and they start arresting Dan, but then fucking Carvanista shows up out of nowhere and kills them. Surely the scene would have been better if he had one Sontaran confront Dan. Dan looks like he's out of hope. Carvanista kills that one Sontaran. That would have kept the Sontarans at their current threat level. Even though one of them was defeated, it was because he was distracted with arresting Dan. Now, Dan has defeat. Dan and Carvanista together have defeated an entire squadron of Sontarans and one idiot guard. <laughs> so... This is beginning to look a lot less realistic, and the Santarans are beginning to easily lose all the threat value they ever had in this episode. Also, Carvanista being the one Lupari, he literally mentions this, he's the one Lupari sent down to deal with the Santarans. That's another contrivance. Also, why is Carvanista the only Lupari to send, that's been sent down? Their entire fucking race is orbiting Earth right now. They could just send down an entire, like, battalion and start killing Santarans. They didn't have to just send one guy. This could be a full offensive. There are seven and a half billion Lupari ships in the sky right now. Why'd they send one guy? He finally shows up and asserts his dominance over Yaz and Vendor. Again, it probably would have been more impactful if he did all this by himself instead of having two goons right now. Uh, they mean nothing to nobody. Swarm means nothing to nobody. He's just bogged down by Azuran passenger right now. You could easily have just had one villain in the story. Like, even, as I said, even if Azur and Prasenger are given explanations later on in Flux, that doesn't excuse their presence at all. Because any narrative weight they have could have just been combined into Swarm. And he could have been the villain for Flux. You didn't need these other characters. <laughs> Like, n whatever they can do could have just been done by Flux himself. Chibnall has that power to write that in. 
So why he chose to add more characters to just bog down this mess even further, I'll never know. Uh, Swarm starts killing off the Mori now, uh, probably furthering some grand plan of his. Carbonista and Dan make their way through the Thontaran ship, and Carbonista sets it to autopilot into the rest of the fleet, which causes a big explosion, and they he shoots out a trash chute, which just so happens to be in the exact same room, and it just so happens to lead right outside of the ship. This is a spaceship. There, there should probably be airlocks on that. It shouldn't just be like a little vent that you pew, pew, and you, you go down. And then they drop miles down into the, the Thames probably, or just some area. I'm gonna get fucking, dude, there's so many British people that would dunk on me if I, if they heard me say that. They get flung down in the water, which should have killed them anyway. Or at least it should have killed Dan. We don't know how many Gs uh, Carbonista can take. Maybe he's a tank or something. But that should have at least killed Dan. I hate this whole uh, thing where as long as a hero falls into water, as long as it's two block deep water, they're perfectly fine and they can continue living. That's just stupid. And it takes people out of media because obviously when you're going at water that fast from that high up, it's just gonna feel like concrete. There's no way you're fucking living that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, despite me saying all this, I really can't hope for the Carvanista and Dan spinoff. So Mary and the doctor go back to the British hotel and tend to the wounded. The general guy shows up and the doctor explain, begins explaining her master plan. Since the Sontarans need to rest every 27 hours to refuel, the doctor says that going into the ships and draining their supplies while all of the Sontarans are resting. The fact that the villains were thwarted by something they could have solved with uh, two rest schedules is beyond stupid. Literally, the only, like, the one way the Sontarans could have defeated the Doctor, the, the way this entire plan falls apart, is just by having some people fall asleep, maybe 14 hours into the cycle, and the other people fall asleep 27. So you keep this alternating cycle where if one person's asleep for seven and a half minute, the other people are asleep for seven and a half minute. I, do you get what I'm saying? I think you get what I'm saying. They could have just had two sleep schedules. The Sontarans are military guys. This is something that happens in militaries all the time. Different sleep schedules? That's literally mandatory in most militaries. You can't have all of your guys asleep so the enemy can sneak up and like steal your fucking trucks or whatever. You, you can't do that. Why are the Sontarans so stupid all of a sudden? This is, like, okay. The Sontarans have always been pig-headed. They have always been arrogant and rash, and that's always been their downfall. They've never been this stupid, though. They know their shit when it comes to military tactics. This is completely out of character for them. The Doctor goes to confront the Sontaran general. The human general and his men, along with Mary, are left to disable the fleet. During this time, the general and his men apparently set up gunpowder kegs all throughout the Sontaran ships as well, allowing them to be blown up later. How the hell did they get all that powder there without the Doctor or Mary realizing? Plot contrivance. A doctor meets the Sontaran leader, tells him to retreat. Uh, she, makes a, she makes a stupid hit the road jack reference in typical 13 fashion. Uh, but before he can escape, the human general blows up the entire fucking fleet with some kegs of gunpowder. Jesus Christ, that is, I should not have to, I'm not, I'm not even going to explain how stupid that is. I, I'm just going to let you guys feel that one out. Let's just, let's, let's feel this one out. Anyway, the doctor leaves, he meets back up with Dan, um, they notice that the TARDIS is being corrupted by something or whatever. They leave Carbonista behind, presumably for the time being. Uh, as they're uh, hijacked and forced to materialize in the temple. Once they get there, they learn that Swarm has placed Yaz and Vinder in the place of the Mori. For some reason, I don't know why Yaz and Vinder have to be in the place of the Mori. It's not explained. It probably might be explained next week. Anyway, he literally does the whole Thanos thing, and the episode's him ends with him about to snap his fingers and causing all of time to rush, rush through Vinder and Yaz suddenly. This threat is literally undone by the next time teaser <laughs> when we see that Yaz is clearly still alive. So, 
there's more of the Suntarans. I... Let me make this clear. This, ep this review is a lot shorter than my other review. And this is because I had less things to complain about here. I did point out areas where I liked what the episode was doing. Um, however, like, I couldn't, like, it's easier to tear something down than it is to build it up. I did like watching this episode. I also like watching the prequels, and the prequels are dog shit movies. I'm sorry, but they are. Actually, I'm not sorry. If you genuinely think that the prequels are good, you have no sense of filmography or cinematography at all. Uh, so yeah, I enjoyed this episode. Do I think it's a good episode? Probably not. It's probably just decent. I... Actually, I wouldn't even call it decent. There's so much contrivance in this episode now. I've convinced myself into not liking it as much throughout the course of this review and throughout watching it twice. By the way, if you ever want to review something, watch it twice. Do not just do first impression uh, review. I mean, like, you can do that. You can do, like, oh, first impressions on this media that I just watched. You can totally do that, but don't take that seriously. Like, don't treat it as... This is a serious analysis of the movie, even though you've just seen it once. Watch something at least two or three times before you review it seriously. That's my pro tip. Anyway, that's the Santar and War of the Santar and Santar Ha.